Amen. Good to be back here again. Good to be with you. Open your Bibles this morning, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I have uh, woke up early and uh, worked on this this morning. I had some things in my mind I want to share with you. I'm so excited about the Word of God. Do you love the Word of God today? Amen. I certainly do. And uh, we come to try to build and strengthen uh, upon the foundation that Pastor Abar has already started with you. And uh, I know in form what he preaches and teaches, not in every single message, because obviously I'm not here, but you are. And I want to encourage you today, uh, those of you in the Crossway ministry, those of you that have committed to this good local church, that you listen closely to the Word of God, that you adhere to it, and let God build you up. Let God do something for you. Let God do uh, something in you. Uh, I look over the group this morning, and uh, I, uh, I've got a couple of Bible college students that are here. Uh, gentlemen, why don't you stand, if you would? Would you make an offer? I haven't planned on this, and I, I know I won't regret it. Andrew, come on up here for a minute, would you? Tell these people what you're going to college for. Tell them what you believe. Don't preach on me now because that's my job. Andrew Hutchinson, come on. Well, praise the Lord. It's good to be with y'all this morning. Uh, Jimmy Swagger Bible College is a place where you'll learn how to live for God. In, in simple form, you'll learn the message of the cross. You know, the, the only message that changes people. The only message that we need to hear. Uh, there's a lot of different teachings in the church, as the pastor has already said today. And uh, Paul was talking to the church in Galatia. So, you know, pretty much getting back to the message of the cross is, is, a, is the focus of what we should be preaching and teaching every time. And at the Bible college, uh, every single professor, every single church service, the, every single class, chapel, prayer meeting... It's all centered around Jesus Christ and Him crucified because that is our power source. And uh, if you are able to go to the college, if you're looking for a college to come and get a foundation before you go to off to secular college or if you feel like you're called to the ministry or if you just want to go and avail yourself to that, please do. It's the best choice I've ever made. And I can, I can speak for Logan and all the Bible college students when I say that you will be blessed and you will truly learn how to live for God. Amen. Amen. There's some preaching that young man. <laughs> Amen. Our goal at the Bible College is to train people how to live for God. That's primary. If you don't have the time to go up to Baton Rouge and commit to semester after semester with us, you can uh, participate with us with our online school. And uh, the online school is inexpensive. Uh, for audit classes, it costs $125 per, per class. You'll be able to learn the Word of God uh, by watching the video of the entire class, whatever class you choose, and you can watch it at your time frame when you want to see it, anytime you want to see it when you have a device that can access uh, the Internet, and you can, and you can re-watch any lecture that you care to watch. Uh, and you have four months to watch the entirety of it. If you want to do it for uh, class credit, it's a little bit more, $325 plus the cost of text, and you get the burden of work uh, that will help reinforce some of the things that you're learning. But the audit classes and the online courses are all available. You can check them out at uh, jsbc.edu. That's jsbc.edu. Take advantage of it. We have some materials in the back. I'll just make mention. Uh, Crossfire Bibles for $25. The Expositor Study Bible for $40. And then a variety of uh, New Testaments, both Spanish and uh, English. Those are $15 or two for $25. Some great music back there, $10 a piece for the music CDs or three for $25. And CD DVDs, uh, two for $25. And anything that's two for $25, you can mix and match. So if you want a CD DVD uh, and a New Testament, you can get that two for $25. Robert's back there, he'll take your money. And we have, I think uh, if it's working, uh, we'll have a device that could read a card. 
and uh, as I said last night, I stopped saying it'll swipe your card, and that's probably not good terminology in today's world. We've got enough theft going on. Amen? Amen. All right, I want to go with you today to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and thank you, Logan and Andrew, uh, for stepping out today. And I put the young man on the spot, but uh, he did good, didn't he? Amen. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we're going to read verses 6 all the way through 16 to the end of the chapter. I won't be able to preach all that because we'd have to come back tonight in order to get it all. But I'm going to read it because the content is so important. Chapter 2, verse 6, how be it, Paul says, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. We're going to come back and talk about that. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world, that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, Neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. As believers, it is imperative that we be built up in the wisdom that comes from God. And that we choose not to be built up or attempting to be built up in the wisdom of man. To be honest with you, these first four chapters of four of First Corinthians, that's the emphasis of them, all four of them. Which wisdom will you choose? Will you choose the wisdom that's given by God and grow in that? Or will you acquiesce to men's wisdom, what uh, people think, what religion things. Preachers and pastors and students and Christians all alike are built exactly the same way by the Spirit of God once based upon a foundation that allows for the Spirit of God to move and live and move in us. And our foundation matters. And so much of our preaching, even your logo on uh, the Crossway Ministry, we preach Christ, we preach the message of the cross, establishes the foundation. But one of the attacks that happens in a church, in the hearts of individuals, and across the world and the nation as we preach the message of the cross, is the connotation or the idea that there has to be something else. There has to be something more. If we focus in on just Christ and Him crucified, well then we'll never get to the deep things of God. I want to prove to you to this morning that there's no way to learn the deep things of God unless you stay on this foundation. Amen. Unless you remain where you have been placed and understand the need that building is ongoing by the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit will never teach you the deep things of God, the intricate things of God, the sensitive things of God, if you ever remove yourself from the foundation of Christ and Him crucified. You can't build on a wrong foundation. Amen. 
I said, you can't build on the wrong foundation. You must build on the right foundation to learn the things of God that he wants you to know. And so I hope I'll interest you by the title and keep some of you awake when I say I'm going to minister this morning learning the deep things of God. Anybody interested? Okay. Learning oh, yeah. the deep, deep things of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We praise you for the opportunity to minister your word. And we ask now that the preacher and the teacher would come, that one that makes preaching and teaching easy, the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit, for only by him and through him can we properly give to the people of God what they need, and only by him and through him can they perceive, comprehend, and apply these things that are about to be said. Help us now, Father, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. All the people said amen, amen. and amen. amen. Most of, not most, but much of what Paul writes in his ministry is the result of a church gone wrong or a church going into a direction that it should not. Correction epistles is what Paul writes much of. Uh, we see correction in the little book of Colossians. We talked about Galatians last night. Uh, and 1 Corinthians, he deals with uh, error. In Ephesians, not so much error, but he's got to reinforce the truth that the Gentiles are just as close to God as any Jew is. And so, so much of Paul's writing, so much of what he gives to us that we now see as the body of Christ, those who are saved, is a corrective situation. And the church at Corinth was no exception. He founds the church of Corinth himself at the end or nearing the end of his second missionary journey. This man is traveling all around the Roman Empire establishing churches and he lands in the town of Corinth. And Corinth was a, a port city. It was a harbor city, which meant that it was on a trade route, which means everything that breathed, every type of person that existed at one time or another traveled through Corinth. And the, Corinth was like our New York City today or San Francisco or that city just down the street. Uh, oh, yeah, New Orleans, uh, the port city where... Uh, as we know, almost anything goes on and anything can go. I'm not trying to be rude or crude to those of you that love New Orleans or are from New Orleans. I, I'm not trying to do that. But the whole point of it is we know that these cities that have a uh, polyglot of peoples and thoughts and, and, and religions and beliefs can become the very center of some very ugly activity. Somebody say amen. Some very immoral activity. And in fact, Corinth was of that stripe to the degree that it was known to be Corinthianized. If you, they said, oh, you've been Corinthianized, that meant you were an immoral person. It meant that you were uh, of the most degraded sort of an individual. So Paul goes into the center of this and he starts a church. Wow. <laughs> goes right into the heart of the evil and starts a church. And he doesn't found it, and this is important, he doesn't found it, establish it on the wisdom of men. He doesn't talk men into serving God. You can't talk people into serving God. If you're trying to talk your family and friends into accepting Christ, it'll never happen. Because you can't convince, if you could convince them to serve God, then someone else will come along and convince them not to serve God. Because we're operating outside of the power source that we have available to us. We talked about this last night, the drawing power of the Holy Spirit. When we preach the truth that is God's That's wisdom, right. the Holy Spirit always moves. Amen. He always does what he is sent to do, and that is to verify truth, to be a witness to what you're saying. So it's really not even how well you say it. You don't have to have a, a theological degree to be able to proclaim and share the gospel. You just have to know the truth. Right. If you know the truth and you speak the truth, God the Holy Ghost will move on your behalf. Right. And that's what Paul did. He goes into Corinth and he uh, establishes a church there based on the truth. And, and all of these evil and all of this ungodliness that surrounded it and the people and the religion... And even the Jews got saved, and for 18 months or more, he's there and he establishes the church. And then he leaves, and ultimately, a few uh, months later, maybe a year later, he goes on his 
second or his third missionary journey and he lands in Ephesus and while he's in Ephesus he gets news of guess what got a church problem anybody that been to church more than a week we have church problems <laughs> we have divisions we have schisms we have oh well one guy says that this is the guy we need to look at and this is the guy we need to follow another guy says oh I like this guy you know I like, well I like brother Matt well I like brother Bob well I like brother Lauren well I like brother Swagger well I just like Jesus <laughs> you know we have the spiritual ones among us yeah. And division started coming, and what was happening, and we'll talk about that, is they were moving away from the wisdom of God that established the church. Amen. And they were starting to operate in what men think, in man's wisdom. And so, as they did, they would encounter all kinds of problems. Listen, if you don't operate in God's wisdom as a believer, you are opening up the door for all kinds of problems. Amen. Not only was there division, there was schisms, there was envy. Why does he get to sing and I don't? Why does she get to preach and I don't? Of course, that would never happen here. <laughs> Why does pastor, oh, they're just his favor. Well, it... And, and then, because we, you know, we always like the people that support us. Well, if the associate likes me, well, then that's my favorite preacher. You know, and we schisms, envy, jealousy, because there's something not being formed in us the way that we need it to be formed. And then the next thing you know, we're off in immorality. Chapter 5 talks about a man who's, okay, Committing incest with his mother. Now, to soften the blow, we say it was his stepmom, but the Bible doesn't say it was his stepmom. We don't know to what to, but the church was, well, glory to God, that's the grace of God covers it. Let me be real plain. There's a message going around, a message of grace so-called, that says it doesn't really matter what you do. That's not the grace of God. Amen. And any message that says you don't confess your sin is not a true grace message. Am I being plain enough? Yes. Any message that says the Holy Spirit doesn't convict you when you fail is not a grace message. Yes. Any message that tells you not to confess your sin after you fail is not the grace of God in action. Yes. Okay, I'm preaching better than you are amen. That's not the grace of God. You can call it a grace revolution if you want to, but it's a grace that goes off. Listen, I when I fail, I go to God based on the finished work of Calvary. And I can rest assured that what I say to him in the privacy between me and him goes directly to God and that he is just. And that he is the justifier and that he is faithful to cleanse me, not because I confessed it, but because Jesus paid for it. When I confess it, I'm saying my faith is in what Jesus did. I did wrong. Please forgive me. God doesn't need your confession per se. You need it in this sense that you can whatever you did, however you failed, you can get up. And know that it's forgotten. Amen. That God is not holding it against you anymore. That it's done. So you can move beyond. Okay, I didn't mean to get into all this. But we can move beyond that failure. you got to move beyond the failure. Why? Because they happen so often. That's right. Amen. Let me preach over here. Because they happen so often. Amen. Because we're human and we fail. We don't. Uh, we don't condone failure. We don't accept it as the way of life. But when we fail, we go to God and we ask Him for forgiveness. And because of what Christ did, He paid the price of every sin. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to His own way. And the Lord has laid on Him, Jesus the Christ, the iniquity of us all. Everything you will ever do or have ever done was paid for by Christ at Calvary. So when we fail, we access that forgiveness and cleansing by faith in Jesus and what he did. And we go on as if it never happened. And if you ask God, well, do you remember what I confessed yesterday? He'd say, I don't know what you're talking about. Because God has the ability and has chosen to choose to forget it. Amen. 
But I don't ignore failure and I don't condone failure. That's not the grace of God. The grace of God is what I just shared with you. The ability that we have. And that's the wisdom of God. But this church was leaving. And so Paul, we're not sure scholars divide themselves up. They think he might have even made a trip over to Corinth or wrote a, a letter that tried to correct it. And it just it just reached with great opposition. Sometimes as leaders and pastors, it's so hurtful to, to have raised up a church or taught a body and then see them go astray. And you come in love, you come with the truth and you come to them and you give it with all of your heart and they just push it away. They just say, I don't want that. And that's what happened. That was the evidence that we have from history. And so Paul would sit down and write this letter that we read today, portion of it. And in those first four chapters, he talks about the fact that the church was dividing up, was envious, was jealousy, there was immorality. Believers were taking believers to uh, court to settle differences. The whole place was a mess. And he said, it's because you're not operating in God's wisdom. You've left God's wisdom. You say, well, why would you say that? In the first four chapters, the, use wis the, the word wisdom is used 17 times in 14 verses. The word wise is used 10 times in nine different verses. 27 times in those four chapters, Paul talks about wisdom. And you can look it over when you go home this afternoon. Read those first four chapters and look at wisdom and wise. And look at the words foolishness. It's given six times in six verses. Foolish two times in two verses. Eight times we see foolishness. 27 times we see the wisdom of God and Paul is comparing what is the wisdom of God to what is the foolishness of men. That's what the whole four chapters is all about. Paul trying to get them back to the wisdom of God. And you know this because it's on your banner. He said, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with what? Not with what? Wisdom of words. Lest the cross of Christ should be made of non-effect. I didn't talk you into something. I spoke the truth of God's redemption plan. And God's Spirit taught you something. Verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, what? Foolishness. Foolishness. You get up and you preach Jesus died for your sin and that the power of Christ's sacrifice can sanctify the believer and that's foolishness to people that don't know him and it's foolishness to religion it's foolishness to the princes and rulers of this world Amen. how in the world could Jesus Christ preached him crucified how could that save how could that sanctify oh that's foolishness but to those of us that are being changed, yeah. that are being transformed, that are yes. being, literally being, being saved, continuously being conformed into the image of Christ. That word is not foolish. It's the power of God. Amen. He goes on and he says, you know, the Jews, they want a sign. And the Greeks, they want wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. To the Greeks, it's foolishness. To the Jews, it's a stumbling block. See it? Why do we preach Jesus? Why do we point to Jesus? Why do we tell you about Jesus? Because when we do, there is a spiritual effect that takes place that does things that only God can do in your life. Right. But I've got to preach this truth to get that spiritual law into effect. If I talk about Jesus, you're going to get help. If I talk about me or my denomination or a routine or a rule, you're not going to get because I'm operating. You're not going to get what you need because the only way. Wait, listen, the only way for you to get 
What you need is for the Holy Spirit to show you what your need is. Right. And he doesn't move unless I'm operating in the wisdom of God. And the wisdom of God is not seeking after a sign. It's not cho choosing to walk after philosophy and psychology. It's me standing up telling you who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And it pleased God by the foolishness. See, what the foolishness of preaching, not just the act of preaching, but also the content of your preaching. God shows the act of preaching to build people, to save people. He, he chose the message of Christ crucified to save people, to build people. It's the foundation. It doesn't make any sense to the world. Are you getting where I'm going? But when I preach Christ, when I teach Christ, when I point to who he is and I point to what he's done, then the Holy Spirit takes those spiritual truths and gives you spiritual material, right. gives you an emphasis in your life. And so many times I'll preach and I'll teach and I'll have people come up to me and they say, oh man, you really nailed me. And then they'll tell me what I nailed them in. And I wasn't even thinking about what they got nailed in or what they got built up in. Why? Because when you preach the message of God, you operate in the wisdom of God, the Holy Ghost does the building. Right. The Holy Spirit does the building. So Paul, showing again what the wisdom of God was, said, when I came to you in that 18 months and I was there, that whole I determined not to preach anything. But Jesus Christ and Him crucified because that's the wisdom of God. He said, I didn't come to you with the wisdom or excellency of speech trying to talk about the things of God. I came to you in weakness and fear and trembling. I wasn't the big dude. I wasn't the big guy. I'm not all that, but I know who he is. And so I pointed you to him. And as I pointed you to him and what he did, then the Holy Spirit, who is God, operating in the world today, since the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is here to both confirm and bring about the benefits to everyone who trusts in God's wisdom, which is Christ and Him crucified. It's Christ who is my wisdom. It's Christ who is my redemption. It's Christ who is my righteousness. It's Christ who is my holiness. And when I preach Him, the Holy Spirit touches your mind and your heart and gives you knowledge and understanding that you can't get anywhere else. So the preaching of Christ and Him crucified is not just an expression. It is a door that opens up the opportunity for the Holy Spirit to labor in individual people. I'll say one thing, preaching Christ and Him crucified, and the Holy Ghost will meet your individual need. You're sorrowing, He'll fix your sorrow. You need healing, He'll heal your body. If you're devastated by events, He can encourage you and lift you up. All through the same message as long as it's founded on God's wisdom and not in man's wisdom. Amen. Amen. Are you following? This is why Paul is directing the church of Corinth all full of problems because they have left the foundation and now they're no longer growing. And the evidence that they're not growing is seen in chapter 3 when he says, man, I want to talk to you about spiritual things, but you are carnal. You're fleshly. You can't take it. You don't understand it. You can't comprehend. I want to talk to you as I did when I first came to you. You were babes in Christ. You should have grown up by now. But see, the evidence that they would left the foundation is that growth wasn't there because growth can only happen on a foundation. This building sits on a foundation. Amen. If you try to build a room in the parking lot, it ain't going to help you. It might stand for a little while, but it's not on the foundation. And so much of Christianity today is extra rooms off the foundation. You don't build off the foundation. Okay. So Paul says, I want your faith to stand not 
with the enticing words of men's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the power of God. He said, when I was with you, there was a demonstration of the Spirit. And today we want to, oh man, we want to have services where we lay hands on people. They fall out. Oh man, that was a demonstration of the Spirit. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is that, once again, when I speak the truth to you, the Spirit of God drives that truth home. And the light comes on. It's revelation. It's illumination to you. And all of a sudden, what you didn't see before, you see. You get it. And that truth walks with you. And feeds you spiritually. And nourishes you. You leave church with a new insight to God that you never had before. And you feed off of that. Amen. Right? Is it, well, who's the cowboy? Elliot. Yeah. Elliot? Is it, was it, what's it, the running back? You know, feed me, right? Right, he's a running back. Okay, you don't watch football, that's cool. But, you know, they, they, it's not a sin to watch football at the right time. The wrong time is when church is going on on Sunday. <laughs> Just threw that out there. But uh, what's Elliot? What's his name? Ezekiel. Oh, thank you. He's, oh, yeah. <laughs> How'd you know? Ezekiel, uh, he does this thing, you know, when he does a good run. Feed me, feed me, feed me. That's what we ought to be doing when we come to church. Feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me. But listen, if your heart and mind isn't centered on the, uh, on the right foundation, you're like one of my grandkids sitting in a high chair. And I come along and I give you this wonderfully prepared meal of mac and cheese and you look at it and you go and you just flip it right off the flip it right off the mac and cheese all over the floor I want that don't feed me that honey you don't know what you need that's right that's right your preachers ought to know what to bring you but if we are not on the right foundation we just take a look at something that's spiritually prepared and think it's men's foolishness or not worthy of us because we're so much more mature oh yeah that's really mature <laughs> yeah. throw the food away that's good preaching. <laughs> because we're off on the wrong foundation now set all those things to just set up these verses for you let's look at them Paul says, we speak wisdom, speaking of leaders, preachers, teachers that are doing it right. We know what they preach. They keep you on the foundation. But why do they preach it? Watch what he says. We speak wisdom, the wisdom of God, among them that are perfect. Now let's be careful there. Perfect simply means a full age. People that are being built up in the things of God, they have become mature through the preaching of God's Word. The principles uh, of God have been implanted by them by the Holy Spirit. And Paul said, here's what I'm trying to do. I'm bringing you a word to the mature. See, again, that's the one thing that I hear over and over again in people that think our message is foolishness. Well, you got to go beyond the cross. If you go beyond the cross, you backslide. There's no that's the you go to the wrong foundation, and now you're not ready to get into the deeper things of God. So Paul says, I want to speak to a church that's mature. I want to speak to a church that's growing. And all of us, hey, all of us have room to grow. Come on, somebody, right? Exactly. All of us. So I got that. But just, you know, you should be by now, at a certain point, you should be uh, growing in grace and the knowledge of the Lord. And Paul says, I want to speak to those of you that are growing, that are in being mature. But then in chapter 3, he turns right around. He says, I want to speak to you, but you're not mature. You're carnal. You're like little babies. You know, I don't want that. I want that. And he says, the evidence that you're carnal is look at the problems that you have amongst each other. You're envious. You're jealous. Is there any problems in the church here? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Do you have a sister big hair complex? Back in the day when 
Big Hair was in, and ladies, you'll understand what I meant. Sister Big Hair was the one that had the hair, the beehive that went, you know, eight feet, seven stories. Took an elevator to get to the top with the bow. You, you ladies remember Sister Big Hair, right? Sister Big Hair would always come and sit right in front of you. I mean, you'd go over here, Sister Big Hair just follows you around. Oh, good to see you. I'd sit down right in front of you. You can't see nothing but a beehive for 45 minutes. You can't worship because you got to go around the beehive. And you leave church angry because of the beehive. You didn't hear anything the preacher said. He said, Love your neighbor as you love yourself. You didn't hear it because you were so upset by the beehive or you were intrigued by the things that were still maintained in the separate stories of the beehive. And you, the sister beehive is ruining your church. Just the way she dresses, the way she shouts, the way she thinks, the way she moves. She's moved, she's wrecking my church! <laughs> If anybody's wrecking your church, that's just evidence that you're not growing Amen. as you ought to. You know, then we can find spiritual will. Do you know what she does on a Saturday? Do you know what she does? Do you know? And then, and then, and then we pray for people. And we put it on Facebook. Praying for Sister Beehive. Because on a Saturday, she do, you know, praying for Got to pray for Sister Beehive. We don't say it, you know, that would be wrong. But we put it out there on Facebook, social media. We tweet it, you know, tweet, tweet, tweet. Pray for Sister Beehive. Because she's ruling it. Why do you do all that? Because there's jealousy and envy. And, why is there jealousy and envy and bothersome? I know it's not fun to sit behind Sister Beehive. But please, you're saved. Filled with the Holy Ghost. Let's grow. Grow up! Amen. I mean, or use a little wisdom. Once she establishes her seat, <laughs> stay right there. Give her a seat belt for her birthday. You know, move. Amen. But to sit there and think about it and dwell on it and go home and let it ruin, and then after a while you come to Brother Matt. I just can't go to church anymore. You don't even know why you can't go to church anymore. Because you're carnal, fleshly. You're not growing up in the things of God. Amen. You're taking the meal that's being served here. You're just going to flip. Paul said, I would that I want to speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Yet not the wisdom of this world nor of the princes of this world. Now the princes of the world are actually addressed in verse 8. These are the rulers of the world. They're physical people. Uh, they killed Christ, the Romans and the religious Jews. So I don't want to have the wisdom of the world and the might and the power of political power or religious power. They don't have, they don't have the answers you need. Religion doesn't hold the, the power that you need to grow. And politically, oh. You know, I know, I'm, I know I'm American and I need to pray for our political system. But I'm a Christian. So I'm going to pray for the whole mess. Amen. But my faith is not in that mess in Washington. My faith right. is in Christ right. and Him crucified. Yeah. I will pray. I will intercede. I will look to, I will vote when it comes my time to vote. But my faith is not in my vote. My faith is in Christ. Because the rulers of this world, they don't know what you know. They don't have access to the information you have access to. Why would you go to them for advice? I don't go to a guy that just declared bankruptcy and say, how do I save money? <laughs> How do I get a successful business? You know, I'm probably not going to listen to that. Why go to the rulers of this world, the intelligentsia of this world? You listen to, I mean, why? Okay, I'm going to be mean here. Get ready. It's not probably really appropriate, but I'm saying it anyway. Why would you base your life on what Phil said or Oprah said? <laughs> When you've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you've got Paul, you've got Brother Matt, for heaven's sake. You're getting your guidance from reality shows.
shows. Who cares who she picks? Amen. Okay. We don't get wisdom from the world. They don't have it. They don't have it. They don't, they, they don't have access to it. But watch here. And I'm, I'm wasting my time, but I'm not. I'm trying to make a point. He says, verse 7, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God before ordained before the world unto our glory. God has mysteries and hidden information. It's hidden from mankind, but it's not to be hidden from you. God ordained that information before the world was formed, knowing what it would do for fallen humanity knowing what it would accomplish in your hearts and in your lives. God's got wisdom. But He doesn't just throw it out. He doesn't just throw all of His information to the, to the swine, lest they turn and rend Him. He gives that information to people that are spiritually prepared to receive it. So are you spiritually prepared this morning to receive the deep things of God? Are you on the foundation of Christ and Him crucified? Are you trusting in who He is and what He has done? Are you walking in the sphere that the Holy Spirit moves? Are you ready to receive some of these things that God wants to show you? Paul says if you're operating in the wisdom of men, you can't get the wisdom of God. If you're operating in the wisdom of God, get ready. I said, get ready. I said, get ready because God's got some things that he's held back and he knows just when to give them to you. Jesus is the author and the finisher of your faith. He gives you just what you need, just when you need it, just as you have to have it. He distributes out the hidden wisdom, the mysteries of God as truth to the born again person who is on the foundation of Christ and him crucified. And it begins to build that believer into a mature believer. Look at verse 9. Eye hath not seen, ear has not heard. Now we've read this scriptures we think, oh, that's when I get to heaven. It has nothing to do about when you get to heaven. It's about the hidden mysteries and truths that God wants to place into your heart today, right now, right here. It has nothing to do with, well, when I get home. We'll talk about that. Hey, I want to get home, but meanwhile, I need some information. I need a little help up in here. I need some touches from God. I, I don't know how to handle this relationship. I don't know how to get through this problem. I don't know how to handle this dilemma. I've got some bad things in me that need to be turned into Christ's good. I need some wisdom, some revelation. Listen, God's got it. Amen. You don't know it because eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has even entered into the heart of man. Watch those things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. God has got your meal prepared today. God has got your needs prepared today. God knows right where you are, right where you live, right what you're going through, what your heartache is, what your hopes are, what your dreams are. God has, you are no mystery to your heavenly Father. He's got these things for you now. Verse 10, you can't see them, but God hath not will, God has revealed them unto us by His Spirit. Amen. Amen. Yes. yes, Lord. Keep it going. Are you getting this? Yes. If we're operating in the wisdom of God, you're going to tap into the riches and the depths and the deep of God, and He knows you. It's not just that you get to know God, but He takes your particular life and your particular need. Whether you're 12 years old and in love with someone who doesn't love you, or you're 80 years old wondering where your next meal is coming from, God is interested in your need. Yes. And He's got your answer. 
And he's got it prepared for you before the foundation of the world. But if you want the hidden mystery, if you want this revelation of what you need in your life, you've got to be on the foundation of Christ and him crucified so that the Holy Spirit can operate in your life. Wow. Because if you're on the right foundation, then God will begin to reveal things to you. The rulers and princes of the world can't get this information. Religious people won't get it. People sitting in church thinking they're going to confess their way and mess their way and say it until they get it, blab it until they grab it. They're not on the right foundation. They'll never get the very things that they want, they need. But God hath prepared for you everything that you need. It exists in Christ. You are complete in Him. Are you doing okay? Am I going too long? I didn't even see when I started. That's a dangerous thing. God reveal eye has not seen ear has not heard if you go back and you look in Isaiah because that's a quotation in verse 9 that's a quotation from Isaiah 64 and it talks about when God first revealed himself to humanity at Sinai where he first gave the law the first principles of what God was like man never had this before and Paul says if you go back and study that and read that chapter later, you, you'll find that it's a reference to that, where Paul uh, is thinking as he writes to Corinth about God revealing the law to Israel, the first revelation. Now, we're not under law today. That's good. You know why? Because we've had a greater revelation of God. Hebrews chapter 1 says that God, who in times past spoke to us through the law and the prophets, the first revelation, what Paul was talking about here. He says, but now he's talking to us through his son. (laughs) So we don't just have the first things which were seen in the law. The basic principles that stopped men from killing each other and gave hope, you know, it's got the law, someone once said, I like it, is God's emergency break. At least don't go this far. But it didn't save. And it couldn't change you because man didn't have the power to be changed through the law. But the basic precepts of the revelation of the law are still in vogue today. There are principles. Okay, I don't want to get off on this too much in another message. But there's principles in the law that God introduced to humanity. Isaiah 64, 4. And he came along and he said, I hasn't seen here, hasn't heard. But look, this is what it is. Jesus came along and said, you've heard them say of old, thou shalt not kill. But the principle behind that is you shouldn't hate Sister Big Hair. Amen. Amen. Ah. Amen. See, the principle of the law is still there. We're not bound by the law. The law has no authority over me. The law cannot condemn me and the law cannot save me. But the principle of the law Keep the Sabbath. What was that? That was a day of rest. What did it represent? What was the principle? Trust in God. Rest in God. We don't rest on a day. We rest in Christ. So the principles of the law are still here. They were initially revealed by the law. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard. That's what Paul is talking about. But today, the fulfillment of that principle is found in Christ. Come unto me, all ye that are... Burden and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus will handle it for me. Rest. Jesus will pay it for me. Rest. Oh, that's foolishness. No, that's the wisdom of God. Versus the foolishness of the rulers of this world. And we have to be on the right foundation. There's another thing that we have to have to be. Go to Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. Matthew chapter 11, verse 25. I've got to hurry. Brother Matt, what time did I start? I don't know, but you have as much time as you need, Brother Matt. Yeah, but, okay. (laughs) You mean a heap of trouble now, boy? (laughs) Pastor just said, no, I won't. I know that the 
Heart and mind can only grasp what the backside can endure. <laughs> Matthew chapter 11, look at verse 25. Look at what Jesus said about revelation, hidden mystery. He said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from who? the wise and the prudent, and you have revealed them unto babes. Now, it doesn't mean that we're babies. Ga, 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 feed me, feed me, change my diaper. It means that our heart attitude is one of humility and dependence. And when your heart attitude is on the foundation of Christ saying, Lord, I trust you. I believe you can reveal to me the things I need to know. God, has, here's the opportunity for you to receive something. Why do you knock and keep on knocking? Ask and keep on asking. It's a show of faith. You're going to keep believing that God has your answer until the answer comes. Not every answer comes immediately. Not every answer comes the first day you ask. Can I get a witness? But a humble person who's relying on the foundation of Christ and His faithfulness knows that if they wait on the Lord, He'll come through for them. And he'll give you that wisdom. He'll teach you about himself. Got to hurry. Let's look at verses 10 through 12. But God hath revealed them what? The things that he has prepared for us unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now, do you get that? There's things about yourself that nobody knows. Not even your husband. Not even your wife knows. It's just what you think. It's what you really think. I always threaten my students. I have this device that if I throw it on your brain and hook you up to it, I can throw your thoughts for the last 24 hours up on a screen. We get to see it. First volunteer. Everybody laughs and ducks, you know. The spirit of man, your spirit knows you. The things you never say. The things you would never reveal. The things you wouldn't ever be honest about. <laughs> you know, I'm not asking for the honesty, believe me. I'm not, I, I got enough mess in here that I don't need yours. But I'm just saying, you know that there's things that you don't tell anybody. But your spirit knows everything about you. You can't hide from yourself. Amen. Right? Your spirit knows. Now listen, when you got saved, God took His Spirit and first of all, regenerated you. He changed your heart. The content of your inner being. That's why we call you a new creation. Amen. The Bible says that He literally circumcised your heart. He took that old heart out heart out that hated God, that didn't want the things of God. And in your soul, the part of man that feels, he placed a desire for God. That's why all of a sudden, instead of hating church and hating this Bible, after you got saved, you fell in love with it. You couldn't ever get enough of it. Amen. Because God changes you want to. Regeneration does that. Amen. But the spirit of man is also reconstructed. It's the part of man that knows, the part of man that receives information, that comprehends. God circumcised your spirit Hallelujah. so that you would be able to comprehend things of the spirit. The new creation man is enabled, not equipped, enabled to receive information. And then watch, God put his spirit in you. Now I'm Pentecostal, but we Pentecostals need to get this right. The moment you get saved, the Spirit of God moves inside of you Amen. and becomes your teacher, becomes your comforter. Amen. Are, you, are you getting that? Amen. That's not the baptism with the Holy Spirit. That's salvation. Amen. The baptism with the Holy Spirit is endowment of power for service. It's a whole other issue. But the moment you're born again, the Holy Spirit moves inside of you. Go with me to uh, John 16. Let's look at his work. 
So many Pentecostals read John 16 or John 14 and say, oh, that's the baptism. No, that's not about the baptism. It's about the coming of the Spirit. Some things are in reference to the baptism. Some things are in reference to salvation. He told his disciples, you don't have the Spirit in you. But he's going to come. The Comforter is coming. Look at John 16, verse 13, 14 and 15. And I'm almost done. Hang in there. Sister Big Hair moves so you can handle a few more minutes. Amen. John 16, 13 through 15. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, the Spirit of truth came on the day of Pentecost. And from that day forward, every born-again believer, every I'll say it this way, every person who was saved previous came into the fullness of New Testament benefit and the Holy Spirit moved inside. And every person from the day of Pentecost has received the Holy Spirit as a person and regeneration at the moment that they're born again. In Acts 2, 1 through 3, we see the Spirit coming indwelling in men and we see acts 2 and 4 which is the endowment of power from high we see both you ought to have both but if all you have is one you have what you need to live holy that's right okay it's religious man that says you have to have the baptism with the holy spirit to live holy it's the wisdom of the cross that says I live holy by the power of the Holy Spirit when my faith is in Christ and in crucified. Amen. Am I trying to play one against the other? No, I'm Pentecostal. I want you to have them both. But I need you to understand how God works. So I want you confident that you have what you need to go into the deeper things of God. Do you need the baptism with the Holy Spirit? Oh, please be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Pastor, please preach on the baptism till they get saved and come through speaking with other tongues. Let God fill you and endue you with power from on high. But this says the Spirit of truth, when the Spirit comes, He will guide you into all truth. He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak. Pastor mentioned it today. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. Now watch. When you're on the right foundation, hearing the right message consistently, the Spirit of God that lives in you gets information from God directly about you and directly to your need. And now the Spirit of God that lives in God, that knows God, now living in you reveals the portion of God to your spirit that you need. Amen. Hallelujah. Whoa! All you can have is whatever God is and whatever God knows. You're limited. Because all the Spirit is ever going to do is take of His and give it to you. Now, if you're not on the foundation you need to be on, you can't get it. But if you're sitting on the foundation and you're humble and you're reliant and you're looking for an answer that's not men's wisdom but God's wisdom, the Holy Ghost is going to take it and speak it right to your heart. This is where, have you ever had that information come? This is how you pay that bill. This is how you handle that situation. This is what, see that's God's spirit taking information from God and revealing it to your spirit. This is how we grow. But it won't happen if you're not on the right foundation. And if you're not on the right foundation, the evidence will be in your everyday life. Amen. And in your church life. We have received, verse 12, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely. So you don't earn this. You can fast and pray, and sometimes we need to. But you're not earning anything. Jesus has already paid the price to give you everything you will ever need. Amen. Amen. When I'm desperate, fasting and prayer is appropriate. When I don't know what to do and I need an answer, certainly fasting and prayer is appropriate. But I am not earning my answer by fasting and prayer. I'm just telling God I'm humble and I am desperate. Amen. Amen. 
Verse 13, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaching, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Okay. So the way to get the hidden knowledge that God has for you is to be obeyed, to be humble, to be reliant, to stay on the foundation of Christ and Him crucified. When Brother Matt gets up and says, I'm going to talk to you about the cross, don't go, oh, again. Because it is your life. It's your foundation. In the later chapters, Paul would say, no other foundation can any other man lay but that which is laid. And he told the leaders at Corinth, you better take heed on how you build because you as leaders, you're going to be judged based on how you build on this foundation. The foundation is Christ and Him crucified. Now get this. A foundation can go up and down, but it can't go left or right. Amen. So you can take the foundation of Christ and Him crucified and take it to the depths of the earth. And you can take it to the heights of the heaven. Everything that God is, everything that God knows, it's available to you when you need it, when you're ready for it. God doesn't speak to you unless you're ready for it. I have things to say to you, but you're not ready for it. Jesus knows one way. But if we're on that foundation, we're positioned to receive it. See? So this is why I love this message. This is why I preach Christ and Him crucified. I want you here so you can receive what you need. But if I get off center, if I get over here and I start trying to live for God, the building has got off the foundation and it's going to topple. If I start emphasizing things that aren't emphasized, if I start making majors out of minors, one of the things that we have today in the church is this big idea, we got to have gifts, we got to have all, you know, we want these great services, we want, woo, we want to have, we want to swing from the chandeliers. Hey, I like services that make me run, that make me want to run, even if I don't. I like services like that, who doesn't? But that's not where I live. Amen. I live here. <laughs> you know, the, every house has different compartments and God will build them for you. Amen. You don't live in the bathroom unless you're female. Um, on Sunday morning, then I know I raised three girls and I have a wife. So, yeah, bathrooms are, got it. Uh, but me, I'm like in and out. I'm a guy. Did I brush my hair? Who cares? I'm a guy. Does it? Thank you. Amen. <laughs> the Spirit of the Lord spoke through the prophet. <laughs> but there are different rooms that God will bring in at different times, but we have to take care. You're God's field, you're God's building. Now watch this. We have misquoted this all for so long. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Right? And, and Paul says that. And then he says, if you destroy the temple of the Holy Ghost, God's going to destroy you. And we said, yeah, that guy that's smoking cigarettes, he's destroying the temple of the Holy Ghost. God's going to take him out. <laughs> and we said that while we were 40 pounds overweight, eating our fourth piece of pecan pie. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking it was a physical truth. <laughs> well, if you do this and you're the temple of God, you do this and you're the temple of God, you do this and you're the temple of God, and God is going to destroy. It's not what that verse says at all. That verse is a warning to those who are called to preach this message that the believer is the temple of God. And if I don't preach this message, I destroy the house in which God lives. Amen. Amen, Amen bro. They are God's field, Pastor Man. They are God's building. They are God's dwelling place. God can build. God's a builder. He knows how to build. It's my job to get you into a position where you can receive and grow. Amen. Well, I don't know if he, if I, I don't even want the deep things of God. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Amen. Amen. If it were not so, I would have told you. And John the Revelator saw what Jesus built. <laughs> A city. 
Amen. I said, God's a builder. It's a city. Well, I don't know if Christ and Him crucified can build me into what I need to be. Well, this message is going to build a city. Amen. Yes. Oh, I'm preaching better than yes. you. Amen. And maybe you didn't read Revelation, but that city is 1,500 miles wide. 1,500 miles long. And 1,500 miles high. All on the foundation of Christ yeah. and Him crucified. Amen. Built by the builder, the master builder, God. And when Amen. we preach the right message and you stay on the right foundation, you get everything that God has and wants to bring into your life by the process of the Holy Spirit's revelation who is able to build you as the dwelling place of God, as the building of God, as the field of God. You bring forth fruit only as you rest on the true foundation established by God's wisdom. Amen. John saw the city. I think I can afford to stay right here where I am and let God build me and give me the deep things of God. Can I get an amen? amen. 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 Would you give the Lord a little praise? I know this is a little long. I know that it might be a little bit uh, too much maybe for some, but I hope it's not. I hope I was able to simplify it. Go back in the next few weeks. Start studying these chapters in their context. Let them get to you. And then when Brother Matt comes and he says, we're going to preach Christ and Him crucified, say, God, I'm ready for the deep things. I'm ready for the deep things. Build me 15 miles high, 1,500 high, wide, and deep. I'm ready for the things of God. Amen? Yes. Amen. Praise God.